Good morning. So happy to see all of you in church this morning. Another uh, packed Sunday with all of you here worshiping with us. Just wanted you to know how much I love having you here. You know, in the uh, one of the ways, one of, in the old, in the early Christian church, when Christians would see each other, they would greet them not by saying, well, you and I would say, hello, how are you doing? They would greet each other by saying, Christ is in our midst. And the response from the people, or the response from the other person was, he is and ever shall be. So let, let's just practice that real quick right now. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. One more time, everyone. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. Like, we truly are not just saying that. We believe that Christ is here with us, praying with us, and worshiping with us. One of the reasons why we have icons in our church is that to remind us that you are not alone. That God is praying with us. And so I love all of you. I love seeing you here. And more importantly, God loves to have all of his houses filled every Sunday morning. And to those of you that are tuning in and worshiping with us online, we love having you part of our virtual family. We love you so, so much. And we're so happy that you've made St. on the Divine a place where you find and you grow in your walk of faith. And if you happen to be new or if you're visiting our church this morning for the very first time, I know there's already new people here because I'm scanning the church and I see people that I don't know or I haven't met formerly. Um, welcome to Saint on the Divine. Please, as you're exiting the church today, either join us in our cafe right next door where we have a beautiful uh, coffee hour or introduce yourself as you're exiting to me or to our welcoming committee. They'll tell you all about the great things that we do here at Saint on the Divine. So let's get started. We are in the final sermon in this sermon series that I've entitled Going All In. And the premise behind this sermon series, friends, is that in the Orthodox Church, you should all know that our New Year's is not January 1st. In fact, in the, or in the Byzantine Empire, New Year's Day was September 1st. And as is within every, at the end of every year, usually at the end of December, we all start to reflect on our life and things that we want to make changes to our lives, things that we want to do differently in the new year. And I'm just making this entire sermon about what are the things that you need to do better at. Like I oftentimes ask people, what would God tell you to stop doing that you are doing right now? And what would he tell you to start doing that you're not doing right now? Because as we're approaching this September 1st, I want you to go all in. Like I'm serious. If we've learned anything in the life that we're living now is that life is short. And I want you to go all in like you've never done before in every facet of your life. And today I want to conclude this sermon series by telling you about something that's very near and dear to my heart. I want to talk to you today about how we need to go all in because we need each other. We need each other, everyone. Friends, God never created us to live on an island all by ourselves. He never yearned for us to simply be by ourselves, to isolate ourselves. God created all of us to live in community with one another, to be next to each other, to pray for one another that's in need of prayer, to encourage a family that's lost a loved one, to tell someone that's battling an illness it's going to be okay, to have people in your life that are feeding you and that you are also feeding them. God created you and me to live in community. But we're living at a time and in a world right now where community is becoming scarce. Let me kind of share with you what I'm sharing, what I want you to understand in a very simple way. I grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Okay, I grew up in the 70s, in the early 80s. Back then, when we would get up in the morning on the weekend, we'd go get our bike, we'd leave the house, and we'd be riding the bike all day long. We'd, come, we'd be hanging out with our friends. We knew all the neighborhood kids. We'd be spending time with each other. Back in those days, community was abundant and content was scarce. We didn't have internet back then. We didn't have 500 channels to look at or live streaming or Netflix or whatever else the streaming services that you may have. We simply enjoyed community and you'd have people come over your house and you'd go over people's house. Community was abundant. Content was scarce. But look how our world has changed today where community now is scarce. Many of us don't even know who are the neighbors that are living in our neighborhood. How often do we see kids playing in the neighborhood? Sometimes you won't even know the kids that are living three or four houses down. Community is scarce. We don't even visit that often with people. 
Sometimes we only connect with the liturgy when we're online. I think it's those of you that are tuning in online. I'm sure there's a good reason why, but we've isolated ourselves. And content is abundant. You got 500 channels to look through. If you don't listen to this sermon, you can listen to a thousand other sermons. You got different churches you can watch. You got Netflix and all the different um, live streaming provided services. You have all these things. And can I just give you just a little thought to think about today? That we are the most digitally connected society and the most socially isolated society. We are digitally connected, but let me tell you, we are socially isolated. I read one in a magazine recently. It said that in no other time in human history have we lived less like tribal people than the generation we're living in now. In other words, we are losing the tribe. The community. That's why you hear people say, hey, you, you just do you. Just do whatever you want to do. Can I just give you a word of encouragement? This is the takeaway today, friends. It's this. I need you. You need me. It was never about you or me. It was always about us and we. I need you. You need me. It was never about you and me, it was always about us and we. In the early Christian church, they understood this. In the book of Acts, which is written by St. Luke, who was the doctor or the physician to St. Paul, he talks about how the early Christian church operated. Like in the Orthodox church, you should all know this as Orthodox Christians, you don't come to church listen to a sermon. You come to church to receive the Eucharist. Why? Because in the early Christian church, they gathered together to pray, and to receive the body and the blood of Christ. There wasn't a lot of music going on. There was singing, but people came together in houses to worship. And listen to what St. Luke, speaking in the book of Acts, what he says about how the early Christians, which we still do today on Sunday mornings when we worship together. Listen to what he says in the book of Acts, chapter 2. If you want to follow along, we're on page 161 in our yellow Bibles. And for those of you tuning in, we're on Acts 2, 42 through 47. Listen to what it says. Acts 2, 42, 47, page 161, second column, three quarters of the way down. It says this. They, referring to the early Christians, would spend their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in fellowship with one another, in community with one another, and sharing in the meal, that being that of the communion and their prayers. Many miracles and wonders were being done through the apostles and everyone was filled with awe. In fact, all of the believers continued in close relationship with one another and shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and their possessions and all would distribute money among all and according to the needs of each and every one of us. Let me just pause right here. How did they know that someone else was in need of money? Because they knew what the people in their pew were going through. They knew what everyone in their pew was going through. They didn't just end the service and walk away. They knew that John Doe over here is in need of financial support, and this family over here needs money. They knew the property that what we are talking about today, the importance of community, that we need each other. Day after day, they met as a group in the church, and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, and they praised God, enjoying each other's company. And oh, how a world that we're living in is so far from that. We're living in a world that's telling us to simply divide. In fact, many of you, after church today, you'll go to the coffee hour, and you'll just stay to yourselves. Or maybe you'll leave church and get away from that community. We are digitally connected, socially isolated. So what do we do about it? I want you to remember these three F's, okay? These three F's that every single one of us should be thinking about. Here's number one. We need to feed, gosh, we need to feed our relationships. In other words, I had a couple come in several months back, and they came into my office. I won't tell you who, because they may be in church and may not be in church, but anyway. And right when they sat down, 
The wife said, this relationship should not take this much work. Like it shouldn't take that much work, Father Nick. And I looked at her and I said, yes, it should. Like relationships never stay where they're at. It's like looking at a fireplace in the middle of winter and wondering why the fire is dimming. Get up, put a log on the fire. Like you've got to feed that relationship. And can I just tell you that some of you today are hearing my voice come across the runway of your heart. And you just need to hear this, that some of us in this church right now need to be fed by the person who's sitting right next to you. That some of the people in our lives that maybe our children need to be fed a little bit more, not with what they need to get done, but how much you love them. And then maybe some of the people that are at your work may need you to just simply feed them. So let me just do a little bit funny because I know this sermon is a little bit serious. Let me just kind of break it a little bit. I'm not picking on the husbands, but let me just pick on the husbands for a little bit. So there's this thing that we call mar marriage builders. And so let me just kind of tell the husbands, y'all listen up, everyone. Husbands don't kick, uh, wives don't kick your husbands. Let me do it for you. Okay, here we go. So these are some things I'd love for you all to do in your relationships. Start every day with a hug. It's coming tomorrow, Roxanne. Thank you. Start every day with a hug. If you're next to someone that you love so much right now, just give them a hug or just tap them. Seriously, just go do it right now. I know it's uncomfortable. Just hug them. Here's another one. Say, I love you every time you part ways. Like every time you leave, part ways. Can you compliment freely and often? Stop being critical of one another. Compliment. Slow down. Slow down. Go on a date every week. One of the best days of the week for me is when the two of us take some time to just be with each other. Go on a date every week. Kiss unexpectedly. That you're not doing now, but kiss unexpectedly. Say you're sorry and mean it. Be forgiving. This one was extremely hard for me. Still struggling with it. Husbands, let your wife give you directions. Laugh, oh, this is for you wives, laugh at our jokes, even if you don't think they're funny. Men, ask your wife to marry you again. Ask her. And women, you better say yes. Never go to bed mad. I'm just simply telling you, friends, relationships never stay where they're at. You got to feed them. Feed them. Here's number two. You feed and you forgive broken relationships. Now, let me tell you something. Out of the three things that I'm sharing with you, this is the hardest one for a lot of people. Because all of us have been hurt by someone. All of us have had times in our life when someone cut us like a knife, said something, did something. All of us have experienced times which someone bothered us so much. And what I want you to lean in, everyone, a little bit. Look at me, okay? Forgiveness is never about the person who offended you. It's never about them. It's all about him. My relationship with God is greater than anyone that could hurt me or offend me. It's never about them. It's all about him. You know, we call the Lord's Prayer, and some people will call the Lord's Prayer the daily prayer. You know, Christ, when he told the disciples and the apostles how to pray, he said, here's the Lord's Prayer, and he gave it to them. He could have mentioned anything in that, in that list of prayers. He could have mentioned anything at all. It's a short statement, only a few statements. He did, though, mention forgive. He said, as much as you forgive others, is as much as God is going to forgive you. And it takes a great deal of humility to truly forgive someone who has offended you. So. Listen for a moment, just for a moment, to what St. John Climacus, who we're going to have his icon in this church shortly, this is what he says comparing us to the devil. He says, 
The devil, this is St. John, this is not my words, these are his words. The devil is better than most Christians. Try not to make you feel bad, but that's what he said. Christians fast from food. The devil never eats. Christians keep vigil. The devil never sleeps. Christians read their Bible. The devil has memorized the Bible. Christians believe in God. The devil has seen God. But there is one thing, one thing that separates the devil from Christians, and that is humility. When we allow our relationship with God to be greater than anyone that has hurt or offended us. He says humility is the only thing that the devil will never and can never imitate. And then St. Gregory of Nyssa, just to add this one last line, says, may we never risk our soul by being resentful or being unforgiving. Notice that. We may put our souls in prison. We feed, we forgive, and here's the third F. We find, we find meaningful relationships. When I was in seminary, one of my professors said to me, when we were going to, he said, if you're going to become a priest, one of the most important decisions you have to make is the spouse, is your wife. Your wife can make or break your ministry. That's what they told us. Then the second thing they told us is they said, you need to make sure that you've got a Paul, Timothy, and Barnabas. You need to make sure you've got a Paul, Timothy, Barnabas. And I didn't know what, that, what they meant by that. The professor says, Paul was someone who was a mentor to people. You know, we celebrate today St. Titus. Titus was an apostle under Paul. Paul let, led him. The book of Timothy was not written by Timothy. It was written by Paul. Paul led him. Paul was an apostle to Luke, the evangelist. People would go to Paul to get wisdom and to get guidance. In my own personal life, I've never told you all this, but I want you all to know this. I have a mentor, and I've had a mentor for months and months. Someone that speaks into my life. I'm going to tell you who it is. This person has spoken to my life, has guided me, not necessarily spiritually, but in how to lead this church. His name is Tim Tosopoulos, the former president of Chick-fil-A. Every month, I'm on the phone with him right after Bible study on a Wednesday night. And your priest is having a mentor. He's having a Paul speak in his life. You may think, wow, Father Nick, do I need to get one? Yes. Like you need to have someone that is speaking into your life. Like someone that, that is guiding you where you may struggle with. Who is your mentor? That's my Paul, is Timothy. It's Tim Tosopoulos. Not only do I have a Paul, I want, he told me that you need to make sure you have a Barnabas. What was Barnabas? Barnabas was someone that Paul could go to and say, this is what I'm struggling with. This is me. This is what I'm struggling with. And some of you men, let me speak to you, the men, more. Because a lot of men, you internalize things. You keep things on the inside. And you need to know that you need a Barnabas in your life. You need someone, I love it to be me. But if it's not me, you need to have someone in your life where you could say, Father or so-and-so, I am struggling with this problem, this addiction. Be careful of a lack of humility because you may be playing on the devil's playground. You need a Paul, you need a Barnabas, and then you need a Timothy, someone that you are speaking into and giving life to them. Someone that says, hey, you know what? Nick Lowe is my Timothy. Who said that to you besides your children, by the way? Who said they're saying, you know what? This person is mentoring me at work. It's guiding me. You need to make sure that you have Paul, Timothy, and Barnabas. We feed, we forgive, and we find. So I leave you with this. In the 1970s, there was a man named Bruce Alexander who was a physician, who was a doctor, a PhD, who was trying to do studies at a college up in Vancouver, Ontario, in, in Canada. And he was studying rats. And if you don't know this, but a lot of studies that are done on humans uh, in trying to understand the human behavior better utilize rats. And so this man, 
Bruce was trying to understand how a rat thinks because their chemical makeup in some ways is similar to that of a human. So they took these rats and they took this rat and they took a whole bunch of other rats in, in one large container and then they isolated one all by himself. In this one where this rat is all by itself, they put two dispensers. One had a drug in the dispenser, like a liquid drug. And then the second dispenser had water. The, per, the rat that was by itself, time and time again, would choose the drug in that dispenser over water. It would start acting inappropriately, would act kind of awkwardly. Every time would take from that dispenser that had the drug in it. But the rats that were in the other container, all they had was the dispenser of just water. So what did they do? They thought, well, let's put that rat that's been by itself into the container where all the other rats are and put the two dispensers in there, one of a drug and one of simply water. Time and time again, all of the rats, when they were all together, did not take from the drug lace dispenser. It's called the Rat Park Study. They've actually done TED Talks about this, to be honest with you. And we actually brought it up in our show this past Tuesday. What's my point? When they were in community, they didn't act bad. They didn't, act, they didn't leave what God's intent, what God's dream was in their life. When they were in community, they were able to save themselves from doing things that would lead them astray. And I'm encouraging you all in a world that's trying to isolate us to remember that we need each other. So go out every day, and today especially, feed your relationships. Feed them. Put a log back on that fire. Forgive the people who have done you wrong. It takes an extra, out, an extra effort of humility, but you don't want to be playing on the devil's playground. It's never about them. It's all about him. And that you would find your Paul, your Timothy, your Barnabas. Because after all, friends, look at me, everyone. I need you. Like, I need you. And you, I hope, need me. It's never about you and me. It's always about us and we. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.